Welcome to the new some MMA podcast in association with MMA Play 365, giving you the edge in MMA betting. I'm your host, as always, Newsome, with your co host, John, and tonight we're back once again to break down UFC 246 from Paradise, Nevada. Happy New Year, guys. It's been a very long break, but strap in because the marathon starts right now. John, welcome. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. Happy New Year to everybody out there. It seems like an absolute age into a last doing this, into a last breaking down some fights. Um, interesting upcoming card, maybe not the uh, the most stacked pay per view of all time, but um, but when the notorious Conor McGregor's back, you know there's going to be some people coming out the woodwork, so it's going to be interesting to break down these fights, man. Yeah, for sure, man. I'm looking forward to it. But just before we start, as always, we need to mention MMA Play 365. As the handicapper over at MMA Play 365, I'm now officially 3-0 and on years betting this sport, which is actually something I'm really proud of. Betting MMA is not easy. It certainly has its ups and downs. But to keep profiting year after year is something not many people achieve. I'm bringing that into 2020, and hopefully we'll have another profitable year this year too. On to MMA Play 365 itself. We're launching something huge for this event. We'll be announcing this within in the next 24 hours so keep an eye out for that it's something we've been working on for a number of months now and we're really excited to get this rolled out and with that said let's break down some fights at UFC 246 in the main event of the Newsom MMA main card you don't have to look any further when the notorious Conor McGregor's headlining an event making the walk to the octagon for the first time since October 2018 we've got Conor McGregor versus Cowboy Cerrone Conor McGregor currently a minus 300 favorite with the comeback on Cowboy at plus 250 John who have you got? Yeah, it's interesting that um, that Conor McGregor's coming back, and we we've seen this fight up at welterweight. I know there's been a lot of talk of it whether um, whether this is the right thing for McGregor. And for, in my opinion, it works perfectly for McGregor because if he loses to to Cowboy at welterweight, he says, well. It's well to wait. I'm a 155er, and these things happen. So, um, so in an ideal world, um, Conor McGregor has, has really got what he wants because if he wins this fight against um, against Cowboy at uh, up at well to wait as well, it opens up a, a, a whole avenue of fights. That Jorge Masvidal fight, of course, that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, there's just so many options. So, um, so as a return fight, I think this is perfect for him as well. I know that there was other names mentioned, Gaethje for one, um, but I think this is the perfect fight back for him. I mean, he's been out for uh, since you say since October 2018 so well over a year now by the time they they step into the octagon and um and obviously he lost that fight took a a, a maul in at the hands of uh, of Khabib like many people do and prior to that his his last fight inside the octagon was against Alvarez back in November 2016 so this is only his second fight inside the octagon for like three and a bit years I mean um that is why he's facing somebody like Donald Cerrone. Maybe not uh, an all-out top three guy, uh, good top, solid top five guy, um, but a, definitely a winnable fight, but certainly not a gimme as well. Now, it's going to be really interesting, this fight, because I don't know how many people saw the interview with McGregor and, um, and Ariel Helwani over the last few days. McGregor was saying he's in great shape. He's saying that he's only uh, weighing about 160, 161 at the moment. I don't know how true that is. Um, <laughs> if that is the case, he looks like he's going to come in well under the welterweight limit, which will be interesting itself. A bit lighter on his feet. I mean, there was a video clip that came out of, um, of him doing a bit of boxing, and he looked very sharp, very crisp in that. But I don't like to take too much from these clips because we only they're not going to show you anything bad, are they? That's, that's what I always think. So... Um, so yeah, don't take too much from that. Maybe um, McGregor's trying to get in Cowboy's head a little bit, saying, "Oh yeah, I'm only weighing 160, 161." I mean, he does look like he's packed on some muscle and things, but that's not always the best case. I mean, when he went up to welterweight for that first fight against Nate Diaz, we saw how quickly it affected his cardio. Now, um, this is a better scenario because he's had a lot longer to to prepare for a fight at this weight. I mean, that fight before um, Nate stepped in at, at short notice and they stepped it up um, in the weight class, so. Really, he, he, although he didn't have to cut much weight, he, he wasn't really preparing um, for, for another guy who's coming in heavy. And um, and I think he'll be a lot better prepared this time around, similar to the second night fight where we saw him go five hard, um, five hard rounds in that fight. Uh, <laughs> McGregor looks... Um, he looks very motivated for this fight. I mean, that's a th- something that people have been talking about. Is he motivated? Is he, uh, is he the, the, the Sam McGregor that um, became the double champ? Um, he does look very motivated for this fight. He seems very motivated. I know he's gone back to his old boxing gym um, and, and been training there quite a lot as well. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Now, Donald Cerrone's opponent, we, we know what he's all about. He's a wily veteran. He's been in there with 
the best of the best, the toughest of the toughest. Now, my worry for Cowboy Cerrone in this fight is the fact that um, he's going up against the tough boxer um, in in. Colin McGregor, and we've seen him struggle against boxers previously. But when we go back through his career, Jorge Masvidal obviously lost that um, earlier in his uh, in his career. Um, and then guys like uh, Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards is a really good boxer. Um, Leon Edwards, of course, got the win. Um, and then he came up against two um, real tough guys in his last two fights in, in Justin Gaethje and, and Tony Ferguson, um, who he struggled against. And, and that Justin Gaethje fight, I think that's a real good blueprint for Conor McGregor in this fight because he um, he showed how he can really, um, Gaethje can really uh, landed some some heavy uh, counter hooks on Donald Cerrone. Those pullback counter hooks, which is um, which is something we like to see um, Conor McGregor use quite often. We saw that in the Aldo fight, that check hook, um, and he'll use it quite often. He'll throw that big straight left and then step back out, and then when his opponent fires in, he's just out of range and catches him with that uh, with that counter hook. Now, interestingly, um, George Saint Pierre gave a good breakdown of this fight because we know that Cerrone's got very underrated grappling. Um, he's very strong in the clinch. He's got a good body lock. He's got decent takedowns as well. Well, if he can utilize those in the first round or two, uh, wear out Connor and, and wear out some of that power, um, you never know. If this goes into the later rounds, I really think uh, Cowboy can cause some some problems for Connor McGregor. I mean, if you look at uh, guys like Robbie Lawler that Cowboys fought, Robbie Lawler hits like a freight train and he couldn't put. Um, Donald Cerrone away so it's going to be interesting if he wears him out a little bit gets later on into the fight whether he he, he can have um he, he whether he can really start to pick it up and pick up the pace we know he's got good um good cardio we know he can go five hard rounds if he can nullify McGregor for a round or two it's going to be very interesting McGregor will want to get him out of there quickly and I think he, um, we're going to see him try to do that and in my opinion I think we are going to see him do that I just think he's too good a boxer like I say Cerrone has struggled against um against boxers. Um, the only real win uh, on his record against really solid boxers is that ally Quinn to win. Um, but as I say, it, it, it's a very difficult one to predict him. I mean, to, I think it's a lot closer than the um, than the betting line suggests because, like I say, Cerrone can um, can nullify his opponents. Um, he can utilise some of his grappling, some of his wrestling early on uh, and, and wear McGregor down. And then I think if it gets to round three, four and five, it's a lot closer fight. But, in my opinion, I think McGregor's going to be ready for that. I think he's going to be anticipating that. I think he's going to be working on that, and I think he's going to try and keep this at his range. Whether he's got the power up at 170 to put Cerrone away, uh, I'm going to edge on the side of yes, he has. We saw him knock down Nate several times in their second fight, um, <coughs> and Nate's got an iron chin. Uh, I think he's got more of a chin than Cerrone. So in my opinion, I think uh, Conor McGregor's boxing is going to be the difference in this. I think he's going to come out quick and sharp in those first two rounds. I do think he's going to land some shots that wobble Cerrone. I think he's going to put him away. So my prediction is Conor McGregor, come back, get back in the wing column, uh, second round finish via strikes. Yeah, I agree with you, John, in regards to the, the betting lines, because I tend to think that this fight should be lined a lot closer than what it is because I don't think this is <clears throat> this is the gimme fight that a lot of people think it is for McGregor. Cowboy Cowboy's tough for anybody, you know. He, he's not going to go away easily. His game is well-rounded everywhere. He's a good striker, good at range, good at, in the clinch. Like you've said, he's got good takedowns. His grappling's at a really high level as well. Whether <clears throat> whether he's on top or whether he's on bottom, you know, he's, he's, he's good on the mat. And... When you look at McGregor's losses, he's lost four fights. They've all come via submission. So it's definitely, for me, it's definitely uh, available to be a, a good path to victory for someone like Cowboy Cerrone. And just sticking with Cowboy, like, you look at the fighters that he loses against. So you've got Justin Gaethje, Tony Ferguson, Leon Edwards, Darren Till, Robbie Lawler, Jorge Masvidal. What all these fighters have got in common is they're very difficult to take down, keep down, and, and be rolled on. And that, to me, tends to be... Uh, a trend that I feel is definitely relevant in this fight because for those fighters that Cowboy can't take down and he can't work a well-rounded game against, he does tend to come up short. But with someone like Conor McGregor, I think he is, you know, he is there to be taken down. I think once he gets him down, I think Cowboy's jiu-jitsu is better than McGregor's. I think he could control him on the ground as well. And, I just, like I say, I feel like that's a really strong path to victory for Cowboy. But on the flip side of things, with Conor McGregor, you know, he hits hard. His, his fight IQ is so good. He's quick. 
Um, his counter's good. He can come forward. He can fight on the front foot. He can fight on the back foot. Uh, he'll work all areas of the body, so legs, body, head, and specifically the body as well. I feel that um, we've, you know, Cowboy has does have a lot of problems against southpaws as well. And with McGregor being a southpaw, I, I do feel that there's going to be, you know, Cowboy is going to be there to hit specifically to the body as well and it really wouldn't surprise me if McGregor hurt Cowboy to the body early on in the fight and you know sort of made that a real problem going forward after then now with this fight I do tend to think that uh you know if there's going to be a storm to weather for for Cowboy for sure I do think McGregor's going to take a couple of minutes to really get his reads in uh really just feel him feel his way into the fight for a little bit you know we haven't seen him for well, since 2018, like I mentioned earlier on. So I do think there's going to be a feeling out process for Connor just to, you know, ease himself into the fight. But after those first couple of minutes or so, I do feel that there's going to be a storm that Cowboy is going to have to weather. And I do think that McGregor's going to hurt him early on as well, which, you know, it's going to be one of those scenarios. Is Cowboy going to go down and is the fight going to be over? Or is Cowboy going to survive and, you know, be on, again, just weather that storm and just get himself composed? Hopefully McGregor ties himself out a little bit potentially trying to get a finish and then work from there so what i'm trying to say really is i think that um mcgregor is going to be very very dangerous for the first 10 minutes of this fight and i feel that if cowboy can get out of that first 10 minutes i do think that that gives him a much better chance to win this fight but honestly i, I feel that when when you look back at cowboy's last two fights um, obviously, the last one against Justin Gaethje, Gaethje knocked him out very early on in that fight, and that's that's a big concern. I know Gaethje hits hard, um, I know his striking's good, but listen, Conor McGregor hits hard, and his striking's also really good as well. So um, that's definitely a worry for me in regards to Cowboy. And then before that, Tony Ferguson, yes, Cowboy started that fight um, a lot better than a lot of people expected, but... Tony Ferguson came back into that fight. He was finding his range. He was landing on Cowboy. So basically in the last two fights for me, I think Cowboy is a little bit more hittable than, than what he used to be. And I also think that the Gaethje knockout shows that he, you know, he can be stopped very early on. So I think those two things are massive factors in this fight. Like I say, I think if this fight goes long, uh, it gives uh, Cowboy a much better chance to win this fight, but I don't think it goes long. So I agree with you again, John. I think Conor McGregor is going to win this fight. I think he's going to knock Cowboy out early. So I've got Conor McGregor to win. I've got him to win via knockout. And in the next fight on the Newsom MMA main card, we've got Anthony Pettis versus Carlos Diego Fajaya. Anthony Pettis, a plus 215 underdog. The comeback on Carlos Fajaya, minus 255. John, who have you got? Yeah, this is a really interesting fight in my opinion because um because obviously Anthony Pettis is a guy that we know now he's kind of um taken up a, a bit of a role of a backseat uh, bad motherfucker because he'll fight anybody, he fights any weight, um he loves it man. He's he's licking those uh, that blood off his gloves and stuff. He's uh, he's turned into a uh, to a real a bad guy who who will just pretty much fight anyone anywhere at the moment and uh we've seen that um across his records and the guys he's fought eddie alvarez barboza max holloway dustin poirier folks and wonderboy thompson nate diaz in the last fight uh, and he's going up against somebody in uh in carlos diego Fajaya who is really on a bit of a tear right now i mean his last loss came in 2015 april of 2015 against dustin poirier we know um what dustin poirier is all about um top contender obviously just recently fought against Khabib for the belt um and and he's on this five fight win streak I mean he's looked so much better in his last three or four of those fights as well um we know that he's got a ridiculously good ground game um which is really interesting because Anthony Pettis has got a, a really sneakily good ground game as well especially off his back so you like to think that that kind of nullifies um, itself for, for both of these guys. Obviously, on paper, um, Carlos Diego Fajera has got the the, the, the more um, the more respected um, grappling background, but uh, sometimes that doesn't always translate over to to mixed martial arts grappling. But I think in uh, in the case of Carlos Diego Fajera, he does. He's a, he's a very good um, very good grappler. He's good off his back. Uh, he's he's good on top, as you'd expect. Um, but I, I think that can really nullify things between the two. Something that we've seen from um, from Diego Vare the last few fights is the much improvement in his striking game. I mean, uh, he looks a lot more comfortable standing. He looks a lot more comfortable um, 
in in the boxing range uh he, just his overall striking game has, has really come on and um for me it's his last fight against Merbet Tysonov which really kind of stood out because Tysonov's an absolute beast man Tysonov puts guys away he, he knocks them out coals um He's a really good striker himself, very well-rounded fighter, uh, and it was a fantastic performance, and he, he, he dominated um, outside a, a couple of sketchy moments in the first round where he, he got uh, a little bit wobbled a couple of times. He um, he, he absolutely dominated the last two rounds, um, and, and, and that win, I mean, when you look at the other four wins in this five-fight win streak, you've got uh, Olivia Obin, Mercier, Jared Gordon, Carl Nelson, Houston Kabalov, um, no disrespect to those guys. I mean, they're they're good fighters in their in their own rights, but they're not real top level guys. And um, Tyson Muff was one step up, and and I think Anthony Pettis is a is a gateway to that real um, that real good level because. Um, when Pettis loses, he only loses to good guys. When he's got a lot of L's on his record recently, but when you look at who they're against, man, Nate Diaz, Tony Ferguson, Dustin Poirier, Max Holloway, Barbosa, Alvarez, Rafael dos Anjos, I mean, they're all elite of the elite over the years, and um, and there's a clear path and there's a clear blueprint as to how to beat um, Anthony Pettis, and that is with pressure. And something we saw massively in that last fight for Diego Vaya was pressure. Literally from the very first bell, he just came out and um, and he was right up in the face of Merbet Tysumov. And his path to victory has got to be exactly the same again. He's got to really push the pace. He's got to push Anthony Pettis. Pettis doesn't like fighting again with his back against the fence. I know we saw what he can do with his back against the fence uh, in the Wonder Boy fight when he uh, when he landed that Superman punch off the fence, but realistically, um, he, he can't do that every fight, and that's why we see him take these L's, because um, because he, he, he ends up, he starts well, he, he starts first round decent, um, he's very dangerous first round fighter, but then when an opponent really starts to push the pace, push the pressure, back him up, that's when he starts to really struggle, and that's when um, that's when you see guys kind of overwhelming him, and, uh, and, and that's what Carlos Diego Vajera has got to do in this fight. I think he really needs to push him up against the fence. He doesn't have to really worry about it. One of the good things he doesn't have to worry about at all with really pretty much any fighter is getting taken down because of uh, that grappling background, because of how good his um, his ground game is. So he doesn't really mind if he gets taken down. So that allows him um, that that opportunity to to really just press. Now, obviously, the one thing you have to be careful about when you're pressing is is just pressing in those straight lines and and making yourself very hittable. Um, as I said, Tysumov did have a little bit of success. He did, he did rock uh, Diego Fajardo in their in their fight in the first round because uh, Diego Fajardo was pressuring and kind of walked onto a punch. You'll have to be careful of that against Anthony Pettis, especially the kicks of Pettis as well. Pettis can get those kicks off from short range. He doesn't need um, he doesn't need a massive kicking range to get those kicks off. So you'll have to be very careful of that. But I think if Diego Fajardo can get out of the first round in this fight. I think it's going to be a miserable time for Anthony Pettis. I, I really do think Pettis needs to get him out of there in round one with his uh, with his strikes. I don't think he's going to be able to submit him. Um, I, I don't really think the fight is going to hit the mat, to be honest. Um, but he's got to get him out of there with uh, with strikes in the first round. Obviously, we're going back down to lightweight um, for this fight as well. We've seen... Uh, We've seen um, Pettis move up to welterweight for his last few fights, so it'll be interesting to see um, whether he has that that one punch power to, um, to to finish him down at 155. I mean, his last finish through strikes um, at 155. I mean, you, you're going back a long way. I mean, you're going back to I think Donald Cerrone back in 2013 when he, he landed that body kick and the the follow up strikes. Obviously, that um, that Stephen Wonderboy Thompson finish was was up at welterweight, and then his other wins at lightweight have um, have all been via submission or via decision. So it's really interesting. But in my opinion, I think uh, I think Diego Fajardo is going to be able to weather the storm. I mean, um, I mean, Tai Sumov hits hard. He got caught in that fight and he, he managed to come through. Um, do I think Pettis is he's going to be able to land a heavy shot that puts him away in the first round? I, I honestly don't. I, I think Diego Fajardo is going to be able to uh, to withstand um, that round one um, barrage that that we usually see from Pettis, that very strong first round. And I think it's going to 
be similar to the uh, the Taisuma fight. I think he's going to uh, just just press Pettis against the fence and uh, just be relentless with those strikes. He's got a fantastic gas tank, and I think he's just going to overwhelm him. And I think we're going to see another um, another decision victory for for Diego Ferreira via that gas tank of his. Yeah, man, Carlos Diego Ferreira is is one of the most developed fighters um, in this division right now. You know, we we know he's always had that. Uh, jiu-jitsu game is a third degree uh, BJJ black belt I believe and y- you saw that you- you've seen that in his fights especially against uh, Olivier Aubin Mercier you know he his, his transitions his reversals were just really really good to watch and from then he's moved over to Fortis MMA um, and he's just developed his his striking game and like you said John he's now at the point where he, his striking is uh, is is more than good enough to hang at, at this level in the UFC, and he doesn't really have to worry about getting taken down too much because nobody really wants to be down there with him. So, you know, like I say, really, really developed, and <clears throat> that Merbeck Taisuma fight was uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that Merbeck Taisuma fight was so impressive as well, and just the, what makes it even more impressive is not only did Fahea sort of go into Taisumov's domain in that fight. And, you know, I know Taisumov isn't uh, from Dubai, but, you know, it was predominantly his sort of home fight, if you like. Um, but not only did he go into Taisumov's domain, but he had a really, really bad weight cut as well to the point where he was struggling on the scales, yet he still went into that fight that had heat problems inside the arena as well and put on the performance that he did. Super, super impressive. And, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with him as well. But then on to, you know, Anthony Pettis. We know about Pettis. We we know what he's about. He's predominantly a striker with a sneaky jiu-jitsu game, as you've already mentioned. Summited guys like Michael Chiesa and uh, Do Bronx Oliveira as well. You know, how many people can say they've tapped Do Bronx Oliveira? He's, he's such a good grappler in, himself. So I don't think that Pettis would be absolutely out of his depth on the floor with someone like Fahir. In fact, I would really like to see that. I'd love to see this fight hit the mat, but Again, I agree with you, John. I don't think it's going to. I think this fight's going to stay on the feet. And like you've already mentioned, and it's very clear with Anthony Pettis, his weakness right now is pressure. So someone really pressuring him. Now, I do feel that the pressure that Fahea put on Tai um in Dubai, I do feel that's a little um a little over exaggerated because when I watched that fight back, <clears throat> he was pressuring, he was the one moving forward. But he wasn't. It wasn't like a brute force pressure. He wasn't just unloading on Tai Sumov with a barrage of powerful attacks and really suffocating him. It was more pressure to the cage with, you know, some nice boxing, tippy tappy boxing, back off a little bit, angle exit, and then pressure a little bit more. It was sort of soft pressure, if you like, opposed to real hard pressure. And it's the hard pressure that really folds Anthony Pettis. And also the other thing that Pettis struggles against as well is the clinch, you know, going into the clinch, having his back against the cage, exactly what Nate Diaz did against him in his last fight. Whereas Fahea, to me, again, he doesn't have that so much in abundance. You know, it's he, he does <clears throat> he does clinch up at times and he does work in the clinch, but it's not a, it's not a predominant area of, of, of his game. However, if he goes into this fight and makes a, a few developments further and really starts to press, pressure Pettis, really starts to clinch up with him, works him, ties him out... I, th- I think it's his fight to lose, man, for sure. And the the big worry for, An- for Anthony Pettis is his durability inside the cage. Time and time again, he's breaking something, whether it be a hand, a foot, a rib. You know, that's that's a real, real issue for him because even if he's winning the fight, just having just breaking a bone in your body, it just you, it sort of pretty much ends the fight in a way because it's tough to fight through those through those broken bones. Like I say, he's a kicker, so breaking a foot against Nate Diaz, that that was that was almost the end for him. Breaking a hand, you know, he struggled to punch, breaking a rib, I don't even need to explain how bad that would be. So <laughs> like I say, it's <clears throat> I'm having a real, really tough time picking Anthony Pettis to win this fight because I just feel that Diego Fajaya has got a type of game with some developments added to that as well could really, really cause a problem for him. And also he's, he struggles with durability in, inside a cage. So I'm I'm struggling to pick Pettis and for that reason I'm not. I am going to pick Carlos Fajaya to win. The one thing I will say though is 
against Tai Sumov when Fahey was pressing forward. He only had punches coming back from Tai Sumov, and Tai Sumov tired very, very quickly in that fight as well. Whereas Pettis, I don't think will tire as quickly, but he's also got to be wary of kicks. You know, it's not just punches that he's got to he's got to see coming his way whilst he's pushing forward. Pettis will throw kicks up and down the body along with his hands as well. So there are slightly more combinations for Pettis moving backwards, and he can do it backwards as well. He's not just a forward moving fighter. So Fahey definitely has to mind his p's and q's in this fight in regards to coming forward. But I think if uh, I think if he stays composed, stays technical, and keeps moving forward and just landing on Pettis. It's over 15 minutes. I think he'll get the job done. So I'm going to pick Carlos Diego Feia to win. I'm going to take him to win by decision. And in the next fight on the Newsome MMA main card, this is a fight I think everybody's looking forward to. We've got Andre Feely versus Sadiq Youssef. Andre Feely currently a plus 115 underdog with the comeback on Sadiq Youssef at minus 135. John, who have you got? Yeah, this is a this is a really interesting fight, and for me, this is one of my um, possibly my, my my most look forward to uh, fight of the card as well because it's it's such an intriguing fight. I mean, uh, Andre Philly is a guy who I think people forget how long he's been around in the UFC. I think this could be coming up to about his fourteenth fight now in the UFC. He's been around a long time, and it's it's took him a long time to to get to this level and get to the the, the really top end guys i mean um i know he's still got a little bit of a way to go until he's that really coming up against those those top 10 sort of guys but he's certainly making good progress with his last couple of wins against miles jury and uh, and that last win against shaman rice um for me this is a really intriguing um battle of, of styles and um and and that's what makes it such an intriguing fight for, for us fight fans and, and why so many people want to see this. I mean, Andre Philly, he, he fights really well behind that jab. A lot of a lot of his good work is behind that jab and he mixes it up really well um, uh, with his kicks because he'll switch stances quite often and when you see him go to uh, go to that southpaw stance, that's when he tends to land that body kick. We saw that a lot in the, uh, in the Shaman Rice fight. He'll switch to southpaw, land that body kick, switch it back work behind the jab and that jab's really long as well i mean he's five foot eleven he's a very tall um very tall for uh for the for the featherweight division he's got a long reach and um and he'll just pump out that jab pump out that jab land uh, he's got a nice uh, nice hook as well lands that um that can uh, that lead hook that, uh that check hook and um and then he'll switch it up again and and land that body kick and and he's uh, for me i think he's got a really nice fluid uh, the style of striking I mean um, he makes it look quite easy he's got a good movement he moves in and out well and something that we've seen in his last few fights that he's really really worked on I think are those feints of his he's constantly throwing feints and that makes it so hard to time him we saw that in the uh, Shaman Rice fight um, and that was his I mean that was his first um, first finish since 2015 and um and and, and Marais is a tough dude as well, so it's it's a really good win for him, and and I think he he put Shaman Marais off his own game with just with that movement and that constant, like I say, in and out, switching stance, and then any time that uh, Shaman Marais would step in, he'd land that big long jab right in his nose, and um and and it was really interesting, and it, it, I I do really like his um his striking style, and he's going up against a, a guy in Super Sadiq Yusuf who. Um, he's kind of the—I don't want to say he's the opposite. Cause he is a technical guy as well, but he's more of a powerhouse and speed and strength. We saw that in the uh, the his last fight against uh, Gabriel Benitez. Um, I mean, he, he he came out that um, he, he came out there from, from the first bell like a uh, like a hundred meter sprinter out the blocks, man. He was just right up in uh, beneath his face. He was swinging bombs, and um, he ended up getting the win uh, in the, late on in the first round with a nasty uh, nasty counter right hand and and follow up strikes. But he got rocked himself in that fight, and that was because he was kind of um, it was kind of winging a lot of punches and. You can do that when you you have faith in your chin and you've got power in your hands because eventually one of those shots will land. I mean, he hurt Benitez several times before he actually put him away um, with about 45 seconds left of that first round. But um, but yeah, he was really throwing those bombs in that fight. And uh, it's interesting to see they've both got a, a mutual opponent in um, in Shaman Rice. And um, Yusuf was a lot more um, a lot more technical in that Marais fight than he was in that, that Benitez fight. So maybe that was just something that he saw in Benitez that he he's slow out the blocks and um, and he can really come um, can come flying out. But yeah, he, he for me Yusuf is more of a, an explosive striker um, and and 
Andre Philly is that, uh, that technical work behind the jab strike um, kind of striker, which for me is what makes it, like I say, such an interesting fight because um, what do you, who, who do you give the advantage to? Do you give it to the technical guy or do you give it to the guy with the, the, the speed and the power now? We have seen... Um, Andre Philly struggle against some guys with with real speed and um, and, and real good strikers. Um, Michael Johnson being obviously the one that uh, that springs to mind. Michael Johnson uh, obviously lost that it was a very close fight, a uh, split decision loss. Um, but obviously we we did see um, at times in that fight the speed of Michael Johnson. But he's a really quick guy and. Um, and, and so it's really, it's kind of really hard, in my opinion, to to judge whether it's going to be that speed and that power of Sadiq Yusuf, or whether it's going to be that um, the, the the technicalities of uh, of Andre Philly striking that, um, that that gives him the edge. But for me, I'm leaning towards uh, Sadiq Yusuf in this fight. I mean, he, I think he's the. Uh, He's at 26 years old, I think he's the future of um, of the division. I think he's one of those guys that's going to make it to the uh, the top five. I mean, if you look through his last few fights, he's um, he's he's put guys away quickly. He's shown that he can go the distance. As I say, he's he's really quick, uh, heavy-handed. Um, just a, a, he's got good wrestling as well. I mean, he's got a good solid wrestling base. He's not an easy guy to take down. Uh, he, he's kind of the the whole package. And for me, I just think it's going to be that that slight speed advantage, maybe a bit of the pressure as well. Um, if he can get in uh, Andre Philly's face again, so so Philly can't really uh, utilize that jab. Um, I think that's going to be the way that, that Sadiq Yusuf uh, overcomes uh, Andre Philly in this fight, and, and I do think he's going to overcome him. I think he is just going to overwhelm him with uh, with power. I think he's going to overwhelm him with uh, with speed, and uh, and I think he's just going to get get to those punches first, land those punches first. But I do think it's going to be a close fight. I think it's going to be a fight that goes the distance. But ultimately, I'm picking Sadiq Yusuf to win this fight by decision. Yeah, man, this fight is a really good fight, and I really like both of these guys as well. I'm really high on both of these guys, so as much as I want to see it, I'm also a little disappointed that they've got to fight each other, you know. Um, on one hand, you've got Sadiq Youssef, who we've said for a while now on this podcast, the, the, the dude's a legitimate prospect, you know. He's got his, his ceiling so high, he's got a great future ahead of him. But on the other side of the coin, you've got Andre Feely, who is a fighter that, you know, he had he had a bit of a sketchy start in the UFC, alternating wins and losses and stuff like that. But the dude is absolutely not only in form, but he's in his prime right now. You can tell he's a fighter that's hit his prime. He's developed so much over the last couple of years. And this is what makes the fight great. And the other thing that makes the fight great as well is both of these guys are a stylistic nightmare for each other. So... From Sadiq Youssef's point of view, having Andre Feely as an opponent, Feely's so well-rounded. He's a tall fighter. He fights long. Um, he's he's decent at boxing. He's not so good in boxing range, pocket boxing, but his, his punches are really good. His kicking's fluid as well. He'll switch stances when he needs to. His movement's good, constantly on his toes. Um, lateral movement, in and out of range, real good distance management. But also in his back pocket, he's got wrestling as well. And I think some people forget this. Go back to the, to the Bermudez fight. You know, Bermudez is a, was a legit wrestler himself. And uh, Feely was taking him down, albeit he wasn't keeping him down too long. Bermudez, mm-hmm. like, I, like I mentioned, he is a good wrestler. So you can't really expect Andre Feely to go in there and put a wrestling clinic on someone like uh, Bermudez. But um, it was there. The wrestling was there. The takedowns were really well timed, and he's also got Danny Castillo as his coach as well. And again, he's a coach that I rate very highly over at Team Alpha Male. And having that wrestling coach in your corner, I do think that helps Feely and allows him to express his wrestling a little bit more. But then on the other side of the coin, you've got Sadiq Youssef and Andre Feely. To me, watching tape, there's a couple of things, a couple of weaknesses that I noticed with Feely, and one of them specifically is checking leg kicks. And again, I go back to the Bermudez fight. Bermudez was landing leg kick after leg kick after leg kick. Now, the two things that Sadiq Yusuf has in abundance is power in his hands, but he also has really powerful low kicks as well. So if I'm telling you now, if Andre Feely stands there and, take, and takes the kicks off uh, Yusuf as he did off Bermudez, it honestly would not surprise me if Sadiq Yusuf finished him by, by leg kicks. You know, Cause that's, that's the extent of what we're dealing with right here now. This is what I mean, stylistically, that they're a nightmare for each other. I I think it's going to be a really close fight. I think the lines uh, are close for a reason. But I'm leaning towards Andre Feely in this fight. I just feel that 
if he doesn't get knocked out by Yusuf, which is, by the way, is an absolute possibility, you know, if if Sadiq lands on him numerous times, we we're gonna see Feely drop. You know, Yusuf has that sort of power, so make no mistake about that. But like you said, John, you're sort of choosing between the te- the, the the super technical fighter or the powerhouse and. Like I say, at any time, Yusuf could finish him in this fight. But if he doesn't, I feel like Andre Feely is going to be winning this fight until he gets knocked out, if he gets knocked out. And I just think he's got more weapons to deal with Yusuf than what Yusuf's had in his previous opponents. And I actually think and wouldn't be surprised as well if Andre Feely came out with a wrestling-heavy game plan. Pin him up against the cage, work takedowns. If he gets back up, fine, keep a hold of him, but but keep taking him down at the same time as well because what that'll do is that'll nullify the leg kicks of Sadiq and it'll also nullify the, the, the power at boxing range because the fight will be so, you know, in, in close in the clinch and, and work in the ground. I actually think that would, that would fare Feely really well, but even if it doesn't, even if he doesn't come out with that game plan, I feel on the feet, as long as Feely is managing his distance really well, I do think that Yusuf can be nullified. And also, in the Shaman Marias and Sadiq Yusuf fight as well, the one thing that I really noticed then is Sadiq came out as, as he does with heavy leg kicks and comes out really aggressive, starts really fast. But the second that Marias started to throw back and started to get into the fight a little bit himself, those numbers specifically on the low kicks as well started to really lower as the fight went on. So I do think that Yusuf's explosiveness, power and aggression can be nullified by just fighting back and obviously just not getting knocked out. So, like I say, it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, Sadiq landed something hard on Feely or if Feely decided not to start checking leg kicks and, you know, Sadiq broke him broke him down from from the, the base, so to speak. But I, I just like Feely in regards to the weapons and the versatility that he has in this fight. I think there's a couple of game plans that uh, he could work against Sadiq or even mix together to, to you know, have an all-round good performance against someone like Sadiq Youssef. So it is a close fight. I do think uh, both fighters have great path to victories, but I am taking Andre Feely to win. I'm going to take him to win via decision. And in the next fight on the Newsom MMA main card, we've got Chaz Skelly versus Grant Dawson. Chaz Skelly, a plus 225 underdog. The comeback on Grant Dawson at minus 265. John, who have you got? Yeah, again, this is a re- another really interesting fight. Um, I always enjoy watching Chaz Skelly fight because they always seem to be um, there always seems to be something going on. Always seems to be uh, seem to be interesting, fun fights. Um, and he's a dangerous guy, man. He's, he's a good um, he's a good litmus test for for Grant Dawson, who's um, who's he's a bit of an up and comer. Obviously, we know he's, he's 14 and one. Um, that only lost coming in 2016. Uh, he he fights out of Glory MMA with a good team there with James Krause and uh, and Zach Cummins, uh, Megan Anderson, all the rest of the team there. Um, and, and and so far in the UFC, he's he's shown that he's um, he's more than capable, and he, he looks like he definitely at just 25 years old he looks like he can go places in this division and it's going to be really interesting in my opinion to see how this fight plays out because i think both of these guys um are more comfortable on the ground i think especially Chas skelly i think Chas skelly will want to get this fight to the mat um striking's decent um but i think he's at his most uh, at his most dangerous when the fight is on the mat when he's got top control if you give it your back against him um you better watch out because he's got so many rear naked choke wins on his record um he can control you when he uh, when he takes you back we saw that in his last fight that win against jordan griffin um so that really is what he'll want to do he'll want to get you um grant dawson to the mat he'll want to be able to to control him he'll want to get him um take the back as quickly as possible and work for a submission if you can't get that submission just uh just hold that position and, and keep grinding away and chipping away now Grant Dawson himself is um, he's good on the mat. We've seen that. Um, he's got submissions on his win as well. Uh, submissions on his uh, on his record as well. Obviously, we saw first of all that Dana White contender series, that rear naked choke, and then his last fight against Mike Trezano, he he sunk in the rear naked choke in round two. They're both quite similar fighters that they've got that really good back control. They do want to get this fight to the mat. Um, personally, I think Grant Dawson's a little quicker. Um, I think his striking's a little better. Chas Skelly, I think. Maybe slightly edges it um, on the mat just because of uh, of his experience and um, 
and 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 the fact that he's been around for for such a long time, he's um, he, he's seen most things that you can see in this sport, and um, and yeah, I think he he does have that slight edge when the fight gets to the mat. Um, but like I said, I think that Grant Dawson has that slight edge in the, in the stand up, so it's going to be really interesting. And um, and something I like about Grant Dawson is uh, <coughs> is just how. How much he works with that takedown, he he'll get the body lock and he'll he, he's persistent. He doesn't um he doesn't give up the takedown easily. He he'll keep pressuring you. He'll get you up against the fence. He'll keep working um until he does eventually land that takedown. And we saw a couple of times in the uh, in the Charles Skelly fight against Jordan Griffin, he got taken down himself. Um and 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 I think that both of these guys are going to have some success uh, on in the takedowns. And for me, it's whether they're able to to hold out on the mat, and whether they're able to, able to defend themselves and um, and 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 get either get back to their feet or or see the round out if uh, if they're approaching the end of the round, what neither guy can afford to do is is spend too much time on the mat um, because the, the fight can easily slip away with either of these two guys. Like I, said, I think Chas Skelly's got the slightly better control, so Grant Dawson really doesn't want to be on the mat because I feel like Chas Skelly could. Could just use that veteran experience and just grind out a couple of uh, a couple of rounds, and then maybe coast that final round to um to to, to get that victory and 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 um and see the fight out. Um, but equally, like I say, Chas Skelly won't want to uh, want to get himself on the map because he has been submitted before. We saw that against Bobby Murphy, albeit um that was a slightly controversial uh, finish to that fight. Bro, um, that was so <laughs> controversial. Uh, <yeah. laughs> that was so. I watched it again the other day, and that is so controversial. Sorry to cut you in there, man, but yeah, oh, no, it, was... it was definitely, uh, definitely controversial. Um, it's, yeah, so so for me, it's a, it's a really interesting matchup because um, I think both of their main strengths um, counteract one another because the, I think they'll both want to get these fights to the mat. And quite often, we've seen the case where when that. Um, when two guys have got such a such a similar goal that he kind of counteracts each other and it ends up being like a striking battle or if it's two strikes it can be turned into kind of a sloppy wrestling exchanges. But um if that's the case, like I say, I think um I think Grant Dawson has the slight edge. Um and again this is a really tough tough fight to call but um, for me, I'm going with the uh, I'm going with the younger Grant Dawson. Like I say, I think he's slightly quicker. I think he's um, a slightly more athletic of the two. I think when the fight is standing, I think he he has the advantage. Um, when the fight hits the mat, I think like I say, I think Chaska does have a slight advantage, but I by no means think he has a, a a massive advantage. I don't think that he can um I don't think he can massively um like neutralize Grant Dawson and and pin him down. Um, that's what he'll want to do, but whether he can, I don't think he can. Um, I think both guys will exchange takedowns. Uh, I think both guys will have some top control. Um, but ultimately, I do think it's going to be Grant Dawson who comes out successful in this fight. And um, uh, and as I say, Chaskill is a tough guy. Um, that that only uh, the only real recent finish besides the Jason Knight finish. Um, well, he actually hasn't been finished besides um, behind, besides Jason Knight. If you take away that Bobby Moffitt fight, so um, whether whether Grant Dawson is going to be the second guy to properly finish him, I don't think so. I think it's going to be another fight that goes to a decision. But I see uh, I see Grant Dawson just edging this one and taking the decision win. Yeah, again, it's another really good fight, and also again, I think he, I think the betting lines are <clears throat> are really off in this fight as well. I, I think this should be much closer. Now, I do get it. I do think Grand Dawson is um is another fighter to definitely keep your eye on as he's moving up uh, up the rankings in the UFC because I do feel that he he's definitely not there right now, but his ceiling. I do believe is uh, is is very high. Um, like I say, I think he's got some climbing to do and some developing to do. But the kid's still really young, man. He's got time, and I think he'll get there as well. But right now, you know, we've got to look at the fight that he's got in front of him with Chaz Skelly, and it's a really, really interesting fight because when you look at the striking with these guys, neither are 
um, neither are, are prolific strikers, you know, they're, they're both predominantly wrestlers, grapplers, both can strike, absolutely, they won't be at this level in the UFC if they if they couldn't, so they can definitely hang, but on the feet, I actually don't really know who to give the edge to, I think Chaz Skelly would be the more technical striker, from what I've seen, I think Grand Dawson really does have to... Um, polish up that side of his game but i also agree with you as well john i feel that the speed advantage goes to uh grant dawson so it's like i say it's a it's a very very close fight when you're looking at it from a striking perspective but i don't feel that this fight is going to be won and lost on the feet i think it's going to be won and lost on the mat ultimately because grant dawson is a wrestler and he's also relentless as well another reason why i really really like him obviously anybody that knows me well knows i love these uh, relentless wrestlers wrestlers that will look to get the fight to the mat and work and grant dawson likes to to land ground and pound as well so that's really appealing on the eye he's also got a uh, a submission game himself and the same goes for Chaz Skelly you know Chaz Skelly is a very very underrated wrestler and he's got good wrestling defense which makes this fight really really interesting but when he is taken down he sort of gets that grip underneath uh, well over the top of the back of his opponent underneath the crotch um, and you know from there he can hold base he can sweep he can reverse and Skelly's a very very tricky guy to be on the mat with and we saw that with Jordan Griffin I picked Jordan Griffin to win that fight I thought he would win those scrambling exchanges but Chaz Skelly is just much much better than I gave him credit for in that fight and you know I, I'm not gonna I'm not going to forget that or mistake that going forward because he's he's a nightmare to be on the ground with to keep down. Yes, you can get him down. You know, fighters do take him down. Griffin took him down. Jason Knight took him down. But to to keep him on his back and to work on him, it just is not easy at all. And if you make one mistake, he's going to sweep, he's going to reverse, or he's going to try and lock in a submission. And this is where I think Grand Dawson's going to have to be really careful because the one thing that I noticed... Uh, when, when I was watching tape on this fight is when Grand Dawson is on top, in top control and he's transitioning, he just he does lose control of his posture quite a lot. And I feel that that's something, an area where Chaz Skelly can definitely take advantage of. Like I say, if he makes a mistake against Skelly on the mat, you know, Skelly's going to try and get out that position and get a good position himself. And in some of the Chaz Skelly fights, it's almost like he's got this sort of like magnet for a top position. He's, like, like I say, he's just really, really tricky to deal with. Now, the issue for that I have with Skelly in this fight is if Grant Dawson is being relentless and Chaz Skelly's got up a few times or swept him a few times, the fight's gone back up to the feet and Dawson manages to take him back down. At what point does um at what point does Chaz Skelly's cardio and gas tank really start taking a big hit from the relentless pressure and takedowns of, of Dawson? Because when we're looking at uh, at cardio versus cardio, although I don't feel that you know, well, when I look at Grant Dawson against someone like Julian Arosa, he did slow down quite a lot. But I do feel that Grant Dawson's tank has got more in it than than what Chad Skelly's has got. So I do think that if the fight goes long and Grant Dawson does really start to to be relentless and put a real good uh, pressure wrestling stylistic fight on Skelly. I do think that we could start seeing Skelly wear down more and more as the fight goes long. But <clears throat> honestly, the the other the other thing to mention with this as well is even though I think that Dawson's got more in the gas tank than Skelly, when when Skelly was tied against Griffin, as soon as the fight hit the mat, you almost didn't see those you know that that wear and tear on his cardio it sort of stopped, and it just makes me feel that when Skelly's down on the mat, even when he's tired, it, you know that's his domain, that's where he's that's where he's mo the most prolific inside the cage. And I almost feel that he's one of those fighters where when he is left striking and working on the feet for long periods, he can tire. But as soon as he goes to the mat, you know, that's that's where he can work relentlessly without expending cardio. So this is what makes it a really tricky fight to, to pick. And I'm actually going to pick the veteran in this fight. I'm going to pick Chad Skelly to win it. I just feel that... <clears throat> I just feel that this is going to be a veteran performance. I think Grant Dawson's 100% going to have his moments in this fight. I do think he's, he's going to steal a round. I do think the the rounds are all going to be relatively close. This is also a, a low-key pick for fight of the night as well. I just think it's going to be a real fun scramble grapple fest. And 
for that reason, I, I just have to favour Chas Skelly. I just think he's more tricky on the mat, and I think he's got more tools on the mat as well. So I'm going to pick Chas Skelly to win. I'm going to take him to win via decision. And in the next fight on the new some MMA main card, we've got another grapple fest. We've got <laughs> Tim Elliott versus Askar Askarov. Askar Askarov currently minus 125 with the comeback on Tim Elliott, plus 105 underdog. John, who have you got? Yeah, talking of um, scramble grapple fests, we uh, we move on from one and two uh, to probably even more of a scramble grapple fest in uh, in, in Tim Elliott against uh, Askarov. I mean, this fight for me, again, is has just got fun written all over it because uh, I'm a massive fan of Tim Elliott. Uh, whether he wins or loses, he always seems to be in a fun fight. I mean, um, as far as flyweights go, I mean, they get a lot of criticism. I know. Um, I'm delighted that the uh, obviously there's a lot of talk of the flyweight division um, ceasing and um, and it being no more in the UFC. But I'm really glad that it has stayed um, purely due to the fact that we get to see fights like this. I mean. Again, um, this really does, in my opinion, the breakdown echo quite a lot of the the last breakdown in the fact that um, it's going to be really hard to pick between um, who does the better work on the ground because ultimately these these two guys are are grapplers. Tim Elliott um, does his best work on the ground when he's on top, um, although he he is a very underrated striker. He's got very unorthodox movement. Um, he's aggressive in his striking. Uh, he's by no means a slouch when it comes to the stand-up department. Um, Askarov, again, he's he's a more orthodox striker. He doesn't throw as much of the, the flashy stuff as um, as Tim Elliott. And, uh, and, and I think, in my opinion, he's the guy who really does want the fight on the mat more than... Um, uh, out of the two of them, I think he's more of an out-and-out um, grappler than than Tim Elliott is anyway. But um, but he, again, he's he's no slouch standing, so it's it's going to be really interesting to to see how this fight plays out now. Tim Elliott, Elliott's one of those guys that you you don't know what kind of performance you're going to get out of him. I mean, um, he lost his last fight against uh, Davison Figueiredo, um, first round guillotine. He looked he looked good in the first two or three minutes. I mean, I know it ended um, just after the three-minute mark in the first round, but uh, Figueiredo's a really good, well-rounded guy himself. Um, top end of the division. And um, and, and Tim Elliott was having some success on the feet. Figueiredo looked like he was struggling with the, the range and um, and the movement of uh, of, uh, of Tim Elliott. Uh, and then Tim Elliott shot him for that takedown. And, and Man, if you watch that back, that guillotine must have been uh, must have been tied because Tim Elliott was was tapping within about two seconds of uh, of the guillotine being locked on. I mean, um, I mean that must have been a, a super tight choke to um, to force the tap that quickly, and uh, and 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 that's how quickly a, a fight can change. And then you see the other side of Tim Elliott in the Mark De La Rosa fight where he gets that fantastic anaconda choke win, um, and then. Again, back to a loss after 49 seconds of the first round against uh, Ben and Gwyn with that uh, with that rear naked choke. So it's really hard to judge what kind of Tim Elliott you're going to get because he he is so up and down with the uh, with the results. And when you look at the guys that he loses to, um, I don't want to uh, I don't want to offend Ben Ten here by saying that he's the kind of anomaly. But uh, in my opinion, he he is the anomaly guy when you look at the results, um, uh, the Tim Elliott losses. I mean, everyone else is top end division uh, Figueredo, Demetrius Johnson. I mean he gave Demetrius Johnson a torrid time for uh, for a couple of rounds. Um Zach Makovsky, really solid wrestler. Uh, Joe Benavidez, we know what he's all about. Ali Bagautinov, another title challenger. Uh, and John Dodson, a, a perennial um, top of the division guy. So it's really hard to to kind of gauge uh, what kind of team are you going to get. And uh, one thing he really is good at is those scrambles. When he gets taken down, he scrambles well. He gets back to his feet. He reverses the position. He um, he sweeps really well. He can uh, he can submit off his back. But as we've seen before, he's susceptible to being submitted himself. Now, Askarov, we've seen him in his... Um, in his UFC de- debut against Brandon Moreno, they fought to the draw. That was a really, really fun fight. Which, in a fight that played out kind of similarly to how I see this fight playing out between um, between him and Tim Elliott, because Brandon Moreno, a guy who, by the way, he's he's looking fantastic since he's uh, since he's gone back to the UFC. Um, he 
he looked great in that fight and doing the things that Tim Elliott needs to do when he got taken down he scrambled well uh, he reversed the position a couple of times he got back to his feet uh, he made it hard for Askarov every time Askarov grabbed hold of that leg took it to the fence took him down um, he He'd spend 30 seconds, 45 seconds on his back, and then he'd explode, scramble, reverse the position, or get back to his feet and start striking where where he had the advantage. And um, and that really is what Tim Elliott needs to do. He needs to when he does get taken down, which I think he will, because you can take Tim Elliott down. He's he's not um, an, this elite defensive wrestler. Um, you, you can get the takedowns on him. Uh, he can land them. Uh, I think he will get taken down. He does need to get back to his feet really quickly. Um, what Askarov really needs to do is when he takes Tim Elliott down, he's just form a solid base, just keep him there, hold him down for two or three minutes, um, really see out the uh, the rounds. And then when Tim Elliott starts to, to really kind of push for a scramble when he can't to get into that desperation I need to get back to my feet mode that's when he can pounce and really look for the submission because that's something that Askarov does really really well he does transition from um, being on the mat to to getting you in a, a, a finishable position very well we've seen that so many times before in ACB where he's got wins via guillotine a twister anaconda rear naked choke I mean um I mean, he, he, he's got an array of submission victories on his record and um, and he is a very dangerous guy when the uh, when the fight gets to the map. But for me, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Tim Elliott. I mean, I don't know if it's that slight soft spot that I've got for the guy with his, uh, his exciting fighting style, but I think he does have the tools at his disposal to um, to be able to defeat Askarov. We saw it with uh, Moreno. Um, reverse sweep get back to your feet uh, and get back into the striking and I think Tim Elliott does have a slight striking advantage because of how unorthodox he is because of that movement um, he utilizes those low leg kicks really well as well um, if he mixes those in and kind of um, kind of really disrupts the timing and, and, and puts Ascaro's striking uh, timing off I think he'll have the edge on the feet and then I think unless Ascarov has can really nail Tim Elliott down and and pin him to the uh, to the canvas, um, and then look for that submission. I think it's going to be tough for him because Tim Elliott is is so well known for those sweeps and those reversals and uh, and working off his back. And um, I think he's going to be able to get back to his feet. Because, like I say, we saw it with Moreno. If Moreno can do it. I have reason to believe that Tim Elliott can also do it. Um, and for that reason, I think, again, this is going to be a really, really close fight. Um, it's by no means a um, an easy fight to pick either way, but um, I'm slightly leaning towards Tim Elliott. And, uh, and I think Tim Elliott is going to take a, a decision win in this fight. Like I say, it's not 100% confident because we have seen Tim Elliott submitted before. Uh, Askar is very dangerous with his submissions on the ground. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if he, if he did... Um, grab the neck and catch the neck of Elliot in, in something. But um, I'm going to give Elliot the benefit of the doubt and I think he takes a decision win. Yeah, this fight is a really, really fun fight and another low-key uh, fight of the night pick as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, everybody that knows well knows I love wrestlers and wrestlers from Dagestan. So I really, really, really want to like this guy, Askar Askarov. Now, at the minute, I'm just, I just don't think I'm, I'm as impressed with him as what, some other people are and I'm not saying he's not fun to watch you know he's had some some really really fun fights I think like I said I think this is going to be a fun fight as well and he's had some great performances outside of the UFC as well but just at this level of the UFC I'm just yet to be convinced and like I say I, I use those words wisely because it, I'm not saying that I don't think he's a good fighter and uh, I don't think he can go far in the UFC but what I'm saying is just right now I just want to see some more of him before you know I become totally impressed with his overall game because the reason I say this is when you look at a lot of his wins regionally he tends to dominate in one of two ways so he'll either be able to take his opponent down and control on top the other side is he will find a way to the back and he'll lock in body triangle and at that point this is where he's strongest by the way once he's got the back of his opponent at that point is either taking the round or he's taking a finish, you know. That's where he, he definitely wants... That's the position he wants this fight to, to end in. If he can get the back of Tim Elliott, it's, gonna, it's just a nightmare to get off your back. He's a really, really good backpacker. Now, aside from that, I don't really see too much in this fight where he's going to be dominant over someone like Tim Elliott. And 
When Tim Elliott's taken down, it's like you said, he can be taken down. But as soon as he hits the mat in a defensive scenario, Tim Elliott becomes a live wire. And by a live wire, just go back and watch his fights. You know, he just does not settle on his back. He did eventually against <laughs> against Mighty Mouse. But listen, that was prime Demetrius Johnson, you know, sort of three rounds in where Tim Elliott expended so much energy trying to really do well in, in that fight early on. But... He does not settle on his back. The second that he's in a defensive position on the mat, he's he's scrambling, he's reversing, he's trying to look for sweeps, submissions. And like I say, he just goes crazy the second that his back hits the mat. And that's why he's so fun to watch. I don't believe that Askarov can, unless he gets him so tired, and this would be later on in the fight, I don't believe Askarov can sit on top of Tim Elliott in whether that be full guard, half guard, side control, mount. I just don't believe he can sit in those positions without Tim Elliott really trying to work back to his feet and he is really good at working back to his feet as well now the one worry I have for Tim Elliott in this fight is the fact that because he is so crazy and he's such a live wire on the mat that can lead him to being a little overzealous and putting himself into bad positions so we saw that in the Davison Figueredo fight now man Figueredo he could be the best fighter in the division we'll find that out very soon you know he's he's a legitimate fighter and there's no excuses in that fight Tim Elliott took him down he dove straight into a guillotine and got tapped out you know it is what it is that happens when when you've shot a sloppy takedown and hopefully it Tim Elliott can look back at that and, you know, make some make some amends and improvements to make sure he doesn't shoot that takedown with his head that deep into his opponent's hip, you know. But then you look at the other fight that I ha- that I wanted to highlight specifically as well is the Ben Wynn fight. Now, if you watch that fight back, Tim Elliott actually gets hurt a little bit. And I think uh, Elliot said something afterwards, after the fight, that he that he was a little rocked and a little dazed uh, in those grappling exchanges. But Elliot was desperate for a takedown in that fight. Ben Wynn's got some good strike and he's got power in his hands as well. I do think he's a far better striker than Askarov. And when when Ben Wynn started really landing on him and started hurting Elliot a little bit, Elliot just got a little bit more desperate, a little bit more desperate for the takedown to the point where he got his hands on him and he, he got him in a head and arm throw. And we all know how those head and arm throws go. You know, women really actually get away with this quite a lot. They t- they they tend to be really good at these head and arm throws, but mm. in the men's divisions, head and arm throws just don't work, and you you're likely going to end up uh, in a bad position yourself. And that's exactly what happened. Ben Wynn took the back. Um, obviously, Elliot was claimed at the time anyway he was still a little bit dazed a little bit hurt from the striking uh poor mistake with the head and arm throw got his back taken couldn't scramble out of it and got subbed you know i just don't see these scenarios happening in in this askarov fight like askarov could grab a back if, if askarov takes him down and elliot tries to get out of a bad position and gives his back and askarov takes it man that that could be a wrap there and then but i just feel that if this fight is won and lost on the mat which i think it's going to be that that tim elliot's got advantages and he's a D, an NCAA D2 wrestler himself he, you know he's got a real good single leg takedown and I think that's actually going to fare him well in this fight out of anything you know both fighters are switch dance fighters which is going to be interesting but I feel that Elliot if he ends up on the mat in better positions when he grabs a single leg opposed to a double leg but listen if Askarov takes him down and, and manages to get his back he, he's going to be serious problems Tim Elliott and again I'll use the same phrase Tim Elliott has got to mind his P's and Q's in this fight if he wants <laughs> to win because if he doesn't Askarov is Askarov's no slouch man on on the mat and any mistake that Elliot makes Askarov can absolutely take advantage of it so it's going to be a fun fight to watch I think on the feet uh, Askarov's more fundamentally sound Tim Elliott's more awkward I think those styles going to make it a fun fight as well Tim Elliott was land outlanding Davison Figueredo in their fight before obviously um, the submission so it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out on the feet but like I say I think the fight's going to be won and lost on the mat I prefer the scrambling ability of Tim Elliott I think he's wrestling slightly better as well and as long as he doesn't make a stupid mistake in this fight and land himself in a submission or land himself with Askarov on his back I think he's going to take the win so I'm going Tim Elliott to win as well I'm going to take him also to win by decision and with the Newsom MMA main card complete, we'll now quick fire off the remaining Newsom MMA prelims. And first up is Holly Holm versus Raquel Pennington 2. John, who have you got? Yeah, obviously we've seen these two um, former title challengers um, um, in action before. Obviously Holly Holm was victorious in that fight. 
Um, and it was a very close fight. She won the split decision back in 2015. But um, but for me, I, I, I see it going the same way. I mean, um, I know Holly Holmes, 38 years old now. Um, she's losing that slight spring in a step. I mean, when you look at her record, she's um, she's lost five of her last seven fights. Um Raquel Pennington, um, the much younger of the two, only 31 years of age. I know she's lost two of her last three as well, but prior to that, she's um, she, she had a good solid four-fight win streak, um, which obviously led to that title shot in the first place against Amanda Nunes. Um, Raquel Pennington, obviously, we know really what she's about. She wants to get the fight to the mat. She's a very strong wrestler. She's good in the clinch. She's, she's heavy. Um, Holly Holm, more of a, a striker. She uh, obviously, like I say, got that bounce in that step. Um, throws a lot of kicks, a lot of um, a lot of counter strikes with her boxing. Um, I do think she's she's the much better boxer out of the two of them. Um, when you look at her losses, uh, they were all against real tough um, opposition. I mean, obviously the last fight was against Amanda Nunes, the goat in um, in, in women's MMA. Chris Cyborg, probably the previous GOAT uh, until Amanda Nunes uh, knocked her out and, um, in women's, women's MMA. So arguably the two of the... Um, Two of the greatest all-time uh, female mixed martial artists were her last two losses. And then we've got Jermaine Durandamy, Valentina Shevchenko, and obviously that Misha Tate fight, which was, um, she'll be disappointed to have lost that because she dominated for so long. But um, but for me, it's Holly Holmes' fight, this one. I think if she can use her movement, uh, I think she's going to be the quicker of the two. If she can avoid that, that clinch, uh, avoid getting taken down because she can take it down, but... Um, uh, but it is tricky and you do have to work for it. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Pennington does land 8-8 eight, eight down in this fight and spend some time on top. But for the majority of the time, I think it's going to be Holly Holm um, moving around, outstriking Pennington, uh, landing the shots and taking a decision win. Yeah, I agree as well. I I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's Holly Holm's fight for sure. Now, it's going to be relatively close, though, in regards to the fact that I think it's going to go to the judges. And the reason why I think it's going to be close is because Holly Holm predominantly fights on on the back foot she's a more of a counter-striking fighter we all know that we've seen it time and time again from her that's just how she fights and that's where she flourishes and Raquel Pennington is completely the opposite she's a forward pressure fighter that wants to make it dirty and ugly and and slug it out and dirty box getting the clinch that sort of fight so you've you've really got a clash of two styles here now the the worry for for Holly Holm is if she does make this fight close and I don't think she's going to absolutely demolish Pennington and, and steamroll to a win but if this fight is very very close and the judges see that forward pressure of Raquel Pennington then it could make the fight very hairy so in regards to Holly Holm win so that's where that's where I feel the fight is going to be really close but uh, apart from that I just think that it's again it's going to be technique versus uh, versus the the fighter that wants to get inside and make it dirty and ugly with the striking but the fighter with the technique is the one that fights best on the back foot and is a counter striker. So I just feel that the style, the stylistic advantage in the fight sits with Holly Holm. And for that reason, I'm going to take Holly Holm to win. I'm going to take it to win by decision. And in the next fight, we've got Alexei Olenek versus Maurice Green. John, who have you got? Yeah, really interesting fight because... Um... Because I'm excited to see how Maurice Green fares against a real top level um, grappler, and 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 that's something that Alexei Olenek is. If he gets the fight to the ground, whether he's on uh, on top, on his back, whether he's um, he's on um, on bottom in full mount, he could submit you from anywhere. So it's going to be really interesting to see um, how Maurice Green um, how Maurice Green fares uh, in that situation. Maurice Green is the much bigger guy. He's the much more physically imposing guy out of the two. Um, he, he's got a good power. He's got a good striking. Um, he's he's got decent submissions himself. I mean, we've seen him throw up that triangle in his uh, in the Ultimate Fighter finale. Um, he's got wins before he came into the UFC via arm triangle, triangle chokes. I mean, he he's good on the ground himself. Uh, and mixed in with that, he does have that big six foot seven frame and and that power. My worry for a Linux is um, has his chin gone a little bit now I mean um, back to back first round stoppage defeats or be against very high level guys over him and then Walt Harris but Walt Harris finished him in 12 seconds of their fight which which does worry me I mean um, he, he's game right to the end of his career now at 42 years of age um, 
I'm going to go with Maurice Green to win this fight. I think he's going to, um, I think he's going to be the more powerful guy in there. And, and I do worry that, uh, about Elenic's chin now. And like I say, um, that knee from Overeem was brutal. Uh, that flying knee from Walt Harris was arguably even more brutal. And at 42 years old, um, going up against the big, well-built heavyweight, uh, it does worry me. And I do think he might get clipped and, uh, and finish, but you can never rule Alexi Olenek out. You, you never know when he's going to get a submission. Um, he can pull it out of the bag at all times. So it, it is going to be uh, it is going to be interesting. But I'm going with Maurice Green to win this fight via finish. Yeah, the big question in this fight is uh, where Olenek's at in regards to his chin. Because at the end of the day, they are heavyweights. And I suppose at some point in the heavyweight career, you've got to, got to come to terms with the fact that you are going to be knocked out but it's always it's always a big question after you've been completely flatlined so yeah over he finished him but Walter Harris absolutely flatlined him so it always leaves you you're wondering where where that fighter is at and is has it destroyed the chin or is it just another one of those heavyweight knockouts and they'll be okay coming back so that's the real question now in regards to um, the Ezekiel chokes, I've got to talk about this. <laughs> Maurice Green is six foot seven. Now, if you look and and really break down how the Ezekiel choke uh, is pulled off in MMA, well, firstly, you'll be you'll be partly confused because technically it shouldn't work outside the gi, but well, with no gi, should I say? But with with the Ezekiel choke, because Maurice Green is six foot seven, he's so tall. I'm not convinced that that Ezekiel choke is going to be here in that fight. So funny, funny little side story. What I actually did in this fight is uh, I went onto Topology and I brought up the profile of every single fighter that Olenek has Ezekiel choked in his career and looked at the height um, just to see if I was sort of on the right tracks. And the tallest person that he's that he's caught somebody in one of these Ezekiel chokes and he's six foot five, and that was only one guy. There were normally, well, sorry, there were usually majority the majority of them were sort of around between six foot one and six foot three so i'm really interested to see if he can pull an ezekiel choke off a guy so tall like maurice green but i'm actually going the other way i'm going to pick a linic to win because i don't think even though maurice green is developing in his striking and he does have some power and is it enough power to knock a linic out well i think it could be but He's not a prolific striker, you know. He's not an Alistair Overeem, or he's not a Walt uh, a Walt Harris. I think that Alinek has got some underrated striking as well, because at parts of that Overeem fight, he, he was looking relatively comfortable in some parts, you know, good overhands, closing the distance. I think if he can close the distance against Green and stay out of danger and take him down, I think when this fight hits the mat, or if this fight hits the mat. It's, it's a Linux world, man, and I just feel that he's got a massive, massive advantage over Green. And even though Green Green's punching versus the potential chin of a Linux is uh, is a big. Uh, a big difference in this fight. I think the biggest gap in skill is by far on the mat. So for that reason, I've I've got to pick a Linux. So I'm going to take Alexi Linux to win, and I actually think he submits him as well. And in the next fight, we've got Claudia Gadelia against Alexa Grasso. John, who have you got? Yeah, I'll keep this one uh, this one relatively simple because that's how um, this is the way I see it. Uh, Claudia Gadelia tends to do well when she lands takedowns. Um, We've seen that Randa Marcos fight, Carla Esparza, Courtney Casey. Um, Alexa Grasso tends to struggle against fighters who take her down. Carla Esparza, Tatiana Suarez, Felice Herrig. Um, when it's just a, a stand-up battle, like the Karolina uh, Kavalkovic fight, um, she tends to have more success. Uh, if if this fight does stay standing, she, she could have some success and she can make it very difficult fight for for. Claudia Gadelia, but in my opinion, I think that um, that Gadelia is going to be able to take Alexa Grasso down. I think she's going to take her down several times throughout the uh, the duration of this fight. Um, and for me, uh, I think that's going to be a clear path to victory for her. Um, whether she slows down towards the the end of the fight, possibly, and uh, allows Alexa Grasso uh, some respite and some chance to um, to to get some strikes off and, and keep the fight upright for uh, for a while, possibly. But will it be long enough for her to, to get a finish? I don't think so because she's got to go back to 2014 since she got her last finish. Uh, so for that reason, I think it's going to be uh, Claudia Gadelia who wins this fight uh, via decision. 
Yeah, I think this fight is really simple to to analyze as well. And you, you've just you've just mentioned a lot of the the big points. You know, you've got Claudia Gadelia, who um, in recent fights has started to slow down, specifically end of round two into round three, uh, becomes more desperate with the takedowns. And then you've got Grasso that seemingly still can't stuff takedowns. You know, she's getting taken down time and time again. And not only does she get taken down, but she plays guard way too much. And this is where I think she's going to have a huge problem against fighters like um, Carla Esparza and fighters like Claudia Gadelia because you just can't play guard against these fighters. Yeah, you might pull off an opportunistic submission from, from time to time, but at this level against the top girls in the division, I just don't think, uh, I just don't think they're, they're very easy to get out of there. Now, I think it's going to be a classic case of uh, Gedalia coming out there, taking um, taking Grasso down, winning the winning the opening two rounds, and then slowing down in round three. Uh, Grasso then starts to defend some takedowns, starts to really really get off on a striking. It's going to look it's going to look quite sketchy in that third round for Gedalia. Does she finish her? Does she not? Um, I think it's going to be one of those types of fights. But like I say, I just feel that Gedalia is going to win those first two rounds with a takedown in jiu-jitsu. And then she'll slow down and, and likely lose the third round. But at that point, you know, Grasso will have to finish her to get her out of there, which I just don't think she's going to do. So for that reason, I'm going to take Gedalia to win. I'm going to take her to win via decision. And in the next fight, we've got Roxanne Modaferi against Macy Barber. John, who have you got? Uh, yeah, another uh, another fight that I think is going to be um, quite quick to break down. Um, Macy Barber is touted as the the next big thing in the UFC in uh, in female mixed martial arts. So far, she's proved that she's um, she comes out. She's aggressive. She's she's heavy handed. Um, put away Robertson in the first round of our strikes. Uh, in the last fight, JJ Aldridge fight before that. Um, Hannah Cyphers in a UFC debut, and then of course uh, Jamie Colleen in the um, in Dana White Contender Series and and she is a finisher and um it's something you don't um see all that often in um in female mixed martial arts a, a finisher to of uh, of of Macy Barber's magnitude she um she's so aggressive she hits so hard she's relentless when she uh, when she's got a that slight scent of blood she'll she'll come swarming and that's what we really saw in the Robertson fight she um she just landed so many strikes I mean Robertson didn't take a knee she didn't get knocked down but it was just a barrage of punches up against the fence um that, that forced the referee to, to step in now uh Roxanne Modaferi um she want to get the fight to the ground I think um to, to do her best work I mean she is hard to finish when you look through her her record a lot of her losses have come via decision um You've got to go back a long way um, from when she was last finished. However, my worry, um, 37 years old, Macy Barber's definitely got speed and striking advantage. Murder Ferry does like to come forward and pressure. He does give her some success, as we saw in the Anthony and Shevchenko fight. Um, but for me, when she comes forward and pressures, she sometimes does so with um with that head on the center line too often and and makes herself uh, makes herself quite hittable and when you've got a really strong finisher and a really heavy handed fighter like macy barber throwing bombs back at you and you're just standing there right in front of her face um it, it's not a good combination and uh, and for me i think motor ferry's going to try that i think she's going to come out i think she's going to try and pressure macy barber i think she's going to think oh i can wear her down and uh, i can get this fight into the latter rounds and then try and have some success. But in doing so, I think she's going to leave herself vulnerable to a big power counter shot that, um, the barber's going to land. And I think that'll, uh, that'll spell the end. Another flurry similar to the Robertson fight and, uh, and Barber gets the win. So I'm going with Macy Barber to win this fight. And I think she's going to win via strikes. Yeah. Really simple from me. Listen, there's a reason Macy Barber's a minus 1000 favorite in this fight. Um, it's, it's there's three main there's three main things for me there's aggression power and speed which macy barber has in abundance and miles miles ahead of of where roxanne motor ferry is in those three areas as well and i just think it's going to be a real real problem for for motor ferry especially the speed the speed's going to be a real factor um if i'm going to make an argument for the opposite side in regards to roxanne you know close distance try and clinch her up try and overpower in strength but again that's a that's a big question mark that i have does she have the strength advantage as well um try and take it down to the mat and and 
lay on her and try and grab a submission or just run the clock down, try and win rounds. I just don't think it's going to go down like that. I really, really don't see it at all. Macy Barb is 8-0, and, oh, and if, if Roxanne Modafferi is the, is the lady to take that O oh away from Macy, and I, I'll be really, really shocked. I really will. I think uh, I think it's going to be a fight that Barber's, Macy Barber is going to really flourish in. She's going to have a lot of success for as long as it lasts. And I say that because I just don't think it's going to go the distance. So I'm also taking Macy Barber, and I'm also going to take to win via knockout. And in the next fight, we've got Drew Dober versus Nazrat Hakbarash. John, who have you got? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this fight, actually. This is one of the uh, the fights on the undercard that I'm, I'm especially looking forward uh, to seeing. I'm a big fan of Drew Dober. He's, he's aggressive, strong, yeah, comes forward. Um, he, he'll, he'll put his chin on the line to to, uh, to stand and bang, as we saw in the, the, the fights. Frank uh, Camacho, John Tuck. Um, Hat Parast is uh, a good, solid, technical, young uh, fighter, trains in um, at TriStar so you know what you're getting with the uh, with the guys there you know they're going to be technical you know they're going to be um, they're going to be sound and for me it's quite quite similar to um to, to the two stars that we were talking about earlier with Andre Philly and um, and sort of Yusuf, I think Drew Dober's the, the power he throws with everything. Um, he, he he's got heavy hands. He, he'll come forward aggressively. Um, Hatparas for me is the much more technical fighter. Um, he's happy to work on the outside uh, with good solid boxing. Uh, he does have power. We saw that in his last fight against uh, uh, against Joachim Silva. Where he got the finish, Drew Dober himself has power, as we saw against Polo Reyes with that big left cross that um, they got in the win. Uh, really fun fight, I think this will be. Um, but for me, in this one, I'm going with the uh, the more technical guy. I'm going with uh, Nazarat Hakparast. I think just the, the the fact that he's the more technical guy, I think he'll frustrate Drew Dober. I think he will be able to work on the outside, utilize head movement, uh, get Dober swinging those big bombs and missing and um, and then just picking him apart and landing his punches when he needs to. Both guys are tough um, and durable, so I think it is going to go the uh, the distance, but I'm picking uh, Nazrat Hakparas to, uh, to take the decision in the judges' eyes. Yeah, man, like you said as well when you opened uh, your breakdown, I like Drew Dober as well. He's, he's a really good all-round fighter, good Muay Thai skills, good Muay, background, Muay Thai background as well. Um, but he's got wrestling uh, in his back pocket also. However, in this fight, I just think he's he's outmatched, outgunned. You know, Nazrat Hatparast, I think, is, is a real quiet, uh, surging prospect. Um, in this division, I genuinely think his ceiling is extremely high. The kid's still only 24, and yet his his developments from fight to fight are just incredible. His technique, his power, his timing, the angles that he uses while striking, foot moving forwards and backwards. It, honestly, he's just incredible to watch, and um, I I think Drew Doe, but I think it's going to be a fun fight again for as long as it lasts. A little uh, little spoiler alert there, but um, I I think. I think Nazrat is just on another level right now and I just can't wait to see the developments that he's made from his last fight coming into this fight. And listen, he holds he holds a knockout of uh, Joaquim Silva. He holds a win over Mark Diakese. Man, those two wins are absolutely massive and if that doesn't speak volumes for where, where this kid is and how high his ceiling is, then I just don't know what does, you know. I, I just think that... This fight is going to be really, uh, really fun striking battle until uh, Nazrat gets his timing down, and that's the other thing. Real quickly, in that Joachim Silva fight, he's, he he looked like he started really slow, but he didn't. He was just making reads, and once he got that read, he just floored Silva. And I just see the same thing in this fight. I think there's going to be some striking exchanges whilst he's getting his reads, and then I just think Nazrat's just going to land something that puts Dober out. So I'm going to take Nazrat Hackpress to win. I'm going to take him to win by knockout. And in the next fight, we've got Alexa Kamer versus Justin Ledet. John, who have you got? Yeah, I'm excited for this fight as well. I'm excited to see what um, <clears throat> what Alexa Kamer can bring to um, can bring to the UFC. He's an exciting guy. He's only five and zero at the moment, 24 years of age, but all of his fights have um, have finished in a stoppage. Uh, and early stoppages as well. I mean, uh, his last fight in the Contender Series was that massive uh, flying knee uh, after he'd been hurt himself, uh, slightly wobbled. But when you look through his record, first round finish over Marvin Skipper, uh, first round finish over Alan Bowes. Um, 
a, a, he, this guy's a finisher. He, he he looks strong. He looks well rounded. He's uh, his striking's dangerous, and uh, it's going to be really interesting to to see how he fares against UFC level competition. Justin Ledetz, <laughs> he's uh, he's been fed to a couple of real killers in his last two fights: uh, Alexander Rakic and uh, and Johnny Walker. Um, I'm not quite sure why, but I remember picking uh, Ledet against Johnny Walker in that fight, and obviously he got uh, he got folded up after 15 seconds of round one. Um, it's still quite hard to decipher, in my opinion, where quite where Justin Ledet's level is. Um, when you look at his wins in the um, in the UFC, Chase Sherman, Mark Godbeer, uh, um, they're decent guys, but um, obviously neither of them are with the UFC anymore. Um, for me, I think he's he, he is vulnerable to getting caught with uh, with with something big. I mean, uh, not always to to the point where he's going to get finished with it because um, because that last fight against Johnny Walker is the only decision loss uh, uh, the only uh, finish uh, loss he has on his record. But he, he is hittable. From what I've seen of Alexa Kamor, he's 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 a very dangerous striker. I think it's going to end in a similar fashion to the, the Johnny Walker fight. I think uh, Camo, he, he likes to utilize these flying knees and these extravagant, um, these extravagant strikes. And, uh, and I think Ledet's going to get caught with something in there. Uh, I think we're going to see Camo put him away again. So I'm going with uh, Alexi Camo to win this fight via stoppage. Yeah, I've got issues with both of these guys, actually. I, I feel that, um, I feel that Justin Ledet could potentially be damaged goods, and I, I know that sounds harsh to say, but listen, the the knockout from uh, from Johnny Walker was brutal, and then the beating that he took from Alex Rakic, even though <clears throat> even though Alex didn't finish him, it, it was it was just an utterly dominant fight. I, I just feel that 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 can take a lot away from somebody's. Uh, durability and you know therefore affect the career as a mixed martial arts fighter but the, the other side on Kamor I just feel that even I know we landed that I know we landed that knee and uh, it was a spectacular uh, start to a to a finish so to speak um but I just feel that when you go back and watch his fights he's he doesn't have many weapons yet as in regards to striking. So he doesn't throw too many kicks. It just tends to be with his hands, a couple of combinations, that sort of thing. But the one thing that Kamer has is explosive power. So fights can be really close with him and then suddenly bang out of nowhere. Here comes a combination, one punch lands and suddenly the fight's over. And I tend to agree with you as well, John. I just feel that I feel that explosive power is going to land on Ledet at some point. It could even be one of those uh, one of those cases where the fight's really close, or Ledet's looking okay with popping his jab out, but then Alexa Kamor just turns up and turns the lights off. The other side to this is the kid's really young as well, trains with Steve Amiochit, so he's he is going to be developing. How fast he's going to be developing, we're not hundred percent sure. That's why it's going to be really interesting to see him inside the cage. But I just feel that if you said to me now, do you think uh, Kamo's going to land hard on Ledet's chin at least once in 15 minutes? I think he does, and I think when he does, it is going to be lights out. So I'm going to take Alexa Kamer to win, and I'm going to take him to win via knockout. And in the next fight, we've got Brian Kelleher versus Oday Osborne. John, who have you got? Yeah, interesting to see um, Oday Osborne um, making his, his UFC debut, obviously after uh, fighting the contender series against Armando Villarreal. Uh, landed that nice armbar victory in that fight after spending a little bit of time on his back. Looks a dangerous guy. He's um, he's a big guy for this division. I know he's only five foot seven, which only an inch or two taller than Keller, but just his frame is a lot bigger. He's got a really long reach, um, and that's something that Brian Keller has struggled against previously. We we saw him really struggling against uh, Montel Jackson, Marlon Vera, another guy who's got a long reach, um, struggle with. And Keller is one of these guys that I really can't decide. Um, what level the guy's at? Uh, yeah, I, sometimes I think, yeah, this this is, this guy can can beat a lot of, of guys in the division, and uh, and then he suffers setbacks and he gets finished. I mean, he is a tough guy. We've seen that, but um, but I, I like Osborne in this fight. I think um, I think Kelleher does tend to struggle against taller guys, the guys with that um, that long range. He, yeah, has to get inside to to work his boxing, and um, and as long as Osborne keeps his um, 
keep this out of range, keeps this long, utilises that jab, one, two, the front kicks. Um, I, I think he can be successful in this fight. And if he does go to uh, go to the mat and he's on his back, um, Osborne's got submissions. We've seen that before. He's got triangle chokes, um, victory on his record uh, over at Titan as well. So um, really interesting. But I'm going with the UFC newcomer, O'Day Osborne, to win this fight. Um, uh, and I think it's... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you finish Brian Kelleher either when uh, when Kelleher gets a bit desperate in the latter rounds and really starts trying to push forward to get on the inside after he's been frustrated. Uh, so I'm going with uh, Odell Osborne to win this fight via strikes in round three. Yeah, it's funny you mention Montel Jackson as well because after I taped this fight um, and I analysed the fight afterwards, I looked at it and I thought, actually, this could play out quite similar to uh, the Montel Jackson and Brian Keller fight with with the styles and also the uh, the physique of Ode Osborne. To to my surprise, when I actually looked a little bit deeper, Ode Osborne actually trains at Pure Vida with Montel Jackson. So, <laughs> um, the coincidence there. But yeah, I, I agree. Like I like this Ode Osborne kid. He, he's he's athletic. Uh, he's making developments, especially when you look back at his previous fights and then you see the version of himself in the Contender series. It was very obvious that that he developed really well. Um, he keeps range well. It's again another southpaw versus orthodox fight, like the Montel Jackson uh, and Keller fight. And with Ode, he throws a lot of kicks as well. And I always like those southpaws facing orthodox that that do throw kicks because they've got all the open. Well, they've got the inside of uh, of the lead leg, and then they've got the open body, and then the open face is there as well, so to speak. So. Um, yeah, I, I like Osborne in this fight. The one thing, the one area where I am a little concerned with is, um, I know he's great on his back and he's, he's whipped up a lot of submissions off his back as well. You've just got to be careful at this level in the UFC because those arm bars and triangles definitely do not come as easy in the UFC as they do outside of the UFC. So um, he can't, if he does get taken down, he can't just rely on those sub- submission opportunities. Even though he's lanking, he will be able to get his legs up there and he's a lot taller than, than Keller. So he does have that going on for him in, with those submissions, but he just has to, you know, maybe be a little more opportunistic with them than rely on them, but try and get back up to his feet first. But apart from that, yeah, I like Odie Osborne in this fight. Um, I think uh, I think he's going to get the win and I'm not sure the decision comes. I think Brian Keller is really tough, but I do think he can wear him down and take a decision. So I'm going to take Odie Osborne to win. I'm going to take him to win via decision. And in the final fight, we've got Sabina Mazzo versus JJ Aldrich. John, who have you got? Yeah, we um, I briefly spoke about JJ Aldrich earlier when we were talking about the Macy Barber fight. Um, I do like Aldrich. I think she's a good technical fighter. Works behind that jab well. Um, when you look at her losses that she's got, um, either um, within the UFC in the Ultimate Fighter or, or outside the UFC in Invicta, they're all against really tough opponents. Macy Barber obviously um, finished in round two of their fight. Juliana Lima finished her back in 2016. Um, that was just due to the wrestling and, and, and Lima outworking her. Suarez beat her in the Ultimate Fighter. We know what Tatiana Suarez is all about, that that heavy wrestling style. And then uh, going back to 2015, Jamie Morland and Victor. Um, Spina Marzo so far is, um, uh, has, has gone... Um, 50-50 in the UFC, she she won a fight against Shayna Dobson, utilising good wrestling, taking Dobson down and um, uh, and wearing her down and uh, and just outworking her for the three rounds. But then lost that uh, that opener against uh, Moros. Um, for me, I, I fancy JJ Aldridge to win this fight due to the fact that I just like how technical she is. She's a real. Um, she really works behind that jab well. She moves well. Um, she's got good head movement. Um, I know she's got some losses on a record, but like I say, I think they've come to against really decent level opposition. Um, uh, Mazo can get this win. I mean, she just spent some time on top. Um, she can definitely uh, she can definitely grind out the decision, similar to that Dobson uh, fight. But uh, I'm going to go with JJ Aldridge to win the decision in this fight. I think she's just going to be the more slightly more technical striker. Uh, if she can keep it upright for long enough uh, throughout the 15 minutes, I think she's going to get the nod in the judges' eyes. I think this fight ultimately depends on Sabina Mazzo for, for numerous reasons. Firstly, development. So, obviously, from a UFC debut against Marina Moroz, it was quite a poor performance. But then she comes out against Shayna Dobson and looks absolutely incredible. So, I'd, with her being so young as well, training at King's MMA under um, tutorage of Master Rafael Cordero, um, you know, she she is going to be making development. So, that's, that's definitely 
one reason why I think it depends on Mazo. And the other side to this is how Mazo approaches this fight because JJ Aldrich, like you say, her boxing's really good, it's crisp, she pops her jab out well, she's really good in that boxing range. But there's two things that I don't like about Aldrich is, first of all, you can pressure and you can close the distance, uh, remove that boxing rage and suddenly, you know, the fight becomes relatively even again. But the other side to this as well is she takes she takes time off, some horrific time off in every single fight. Like you saw it in her last fight, you know, she she coasted the first round and then suddenly she's, she's taking minutes off in that second round and uh, then her opponent starts coming back into the fights and you know it's it's just not good to see so for me i feel that if mazo's development is is actually really there and still developing really well then can she close the distance can she make the most of the time off the the aldrich will likely take in the fight i just think that a lot of i, I do think the fight's going to be close but i do think a lot of these points just point to a, a mazo win so I don't think there's going to be a finish in this fight, but for that reason, I am going to take Sabina Mazo to win, and I'm going to take it to win via decision. And that's it for this week's podcast, guys. So, John, before we hit the news, some MMA mentions. What do you need to mention, man? Yeah, just as always, on hit me up on social media, on Twitter, at MMA Me. We're talking fights, talking fight news, talking fighters, everything MMA-related. I'm always down for a chat, man, so hit me up at MMA and Me, and, uh, and yeah, let's get talking, man. Awesome. So... Time for the Newsome MMA mentions. And first of all, I want to mention the Newsome MMA website. Don't forget to visit the outlet's website at newsomemma.co.uk where you'll find the locally famous tape index feature, prediction videos, fighter interviews, and the content collaboration with Heavy Duty Fight Management too. You can even request colour commentary and media coverage from Newsome MMA as well. Next up is MMA Play 365, which I spoke about at the start of this podcast. MMA Play 365 is the perfect betting advice platform for any type of gambler, whether you're in this game for the long term or you just want to make some fun bets while watching the fights on the night the goal is to make money and that's exactly what we're going to be doing for you so follow mma play 365 over on twitter facebook and instagram or visit mma play 365.com to subscribe today the next mention is for isogenics who provide supplements solutions and support to professional athletes along with anybody that has an active lifestyle whether that be practicing a sport or just going to the gym be sure to check out the amped performance range of products which are perfect for athletes in all sports to increase energy and performance for when it matters Find Find out more at mmaplay365.com forward slash isogenics. And the final mention is for our sponsor of new some MMA Golden Ticket Fight Promotions. Golden Ticket put on some fantastic MMA shows and are one of the biggest regional promotions in the Midlands over here in the UK. You can find out more information on their next event by following their social channels on Facebook, Instagram.